So I thought maybe now, today I'm going to talk about the applications of the um, pot residue theorem. So I'll just quickly review now in a little more. So I just reviewed it with examples and explaining the theorem itself. And now we'll go more into the, into the uh, calculus of what to do. Okay, so, uh, so the first thing, so today's applications. of the bot residue formula. And so this, as I showed you, you know, for the Grassmann 2 force, I'll review it now in a little bit more detail and more general situations. And, but this still, this form still remains, I think, the most efficient. And it turns out, as you can see, maybe if you look at those notes of HIP, uh, um, uh, the most efficient in terms of calculations, amazingly, is also remains the most efficient method of calculating intersection numbers. So let me just set up this. So we discussed a little bit, just I remind you uh, about symmetric polynomials. Polynomials. So you remember symmetric polynomials are. Yeah. So say we fix some variables um, lambda one, lambda n. Actually, what I'm going to talk about is valid if you just look at integer coefficient polynomials. And then symmetric, of course, means that if you do any permutations of the polynomial, uh, so you take an element here, and uh, a polynomial is symmetric. If you permute the lambdas, it's the same thing. Like, uh, like for example, the sum of lambdas is an, uh, an example. So um, uh, keeping with our notation, what I, uh, the way I'm going to write this in a very brief fashion, I'll put, I put a sigma n here. Sigma n is the permutation group. And when we put something up in the index, it means the invariance. And so that's precisely that. So, but you know what symmetric polynomials are. There's just a notation for that in these uh, variables. So the fundamental theorem of, of, um, of uh, uh, this, of course, they form a ring. So this is a ring, right? Since the product and the sum of symmetric polynomials is symmetric polynomial. The fundamental theorem of, about symmetric polynomials is that, um, uh, well, I don't want to take that part, is that uh, it's actually equivalent, I mean, isomorphic as a ring to, um, sorry, Wait, I made a mistake here, R, right, this will be R, see? Uh, to the polynomial is in R variables, C1 up to CR, and the correspondence is the following, that we just look at product of uh, one uh, plus um, uh, lambda i x. So we look at the, uh, this is a formal symmetric polynomial with a, with a parameter. So we can take each coefficient of this polynomial and they will be symmetric. And so this is just the sum of c i x to the i. Our i goes from zero to r and we set c zero to be one. Okay, so the uh, one important point is that even though these are as rings, uh, this is uh, the fundamental theorem of symmetric polynomials. Is this you probably know this from algebra? In any case, this is true. Uh, one important thing is that um, uh, this is now a perfectly free, wonderful polynomial ring, but it's a graded ring. This is also a graded ring. Here, the degree of lambdas are one, as usual in polynomials. Here, the degrees are different. So here, the degree of lambda i is 1, but the degree of c i is i. All right, the degree of c i is i. Okay, so this is um, uh, our basic thing. And so this, this actually is equality defines this map because we just take the corresponding coefficient. So for example, c1 
is the sum of the lambda i's and CR is the product of the lambda i's. Okay. So now, um, uh, notation-wise, I'll do something terrible, which is that I'll just denote, uh, so there are two polynomial rings. I'll denote the elements, um, maybe say, by phi, and I'll denote them the same way, actually. So, uh, so I'll say that uh, phi of uh, C1 is, for example, um, CR phi of lambda 1 lambda r. More precisely, I'm a mathematician, so I can't do that, so I'll put a little dot here or something to say that it's different, but actually it's, it's uh, let me be actually, I'll put it, oh, let's put it here, okay? So this is the correspondence under this correspondence. So for example, um, um, yeah, I mean, uh, I just identify these two rings and these polynomials phi and polynomial phi will all denote by the same way. So now the idea is that we can define from here then the characteristic map. Characteristic classes. So I'm saying something that we already know, but just in a somewhat more characteristic classes. And this idea is the following. For simplicity, let's assume that X is some smooth projective variety with some so with the dimension n, and then we have some vector bundle rank r on it. And so the idea now is that I can take this ring of symmetric polynomials and uh, uh, we get what's called the characteristic map. So it's the following thing. So, um, well, I have to do it vertically now. Um, so this picture here induces a map. Well, let me just take Q coefficients for simplicity. So I take the same thing, but symmetric points, but now with rational coefficients. And we can map it now um, to, to the Chow groups of, uh, of X. Okay, I will... Um, And so the map is the following. Uh, if I, so, yeah, maybe I'll repeat it here. I don't, I can't do this vertically somehow. It makes me dizzy. So, so I will, this map depends on E, of course. But I'll not have a separate notation for it. Rather, I'll say that if I take a polynomial here, then the corresponding element will be just called phi of e. So I will triple terrible denote things because now there's another thing of phi of e. Right? And so, um, of course, the idea is the following, that simply uh, the polynomial ci will, will just go to ci of e to the churn class and then, uh, then uh, is just, this is a ring homomorphism, so sums and products go to sums and products. Since this is a free ring, there is no problem. This is defined. Okay. So one can also, uh, uh, in the equivariant case, it's completely analogous. So you just, uh, I'll just denote this slightly differently. So phi, the equivariant churn classes, will just go to phi of t of e. Uh, that's the notation. And now this will be in a, a t of X. Okay, so this is, was our notation. So now, a little bit of what we haven't done yet. So let's just discuss, again, go back for a second to the case of the point. So the uh, case of a point, because there actually this is, everything reduces to that, so we have to understand this very well. So the situation you remember is this unfortunate uh, uh, convention that I chose that now is not going to be incredibly convenient, but I already chose it, so it's too late now. And this was the following that I said that um, if you take a CA, so this is just, you remember, A is an integer, 
and CA is just C, but is uh, C with, but it's an equivariant with a T action of T, uh, T, Z goes to T to the A, Z times Z, right? This is the action on C, and so, this is dangerous. Okay, so then uh, on the other hand, we know that the equivariant churn class is, um, equivariant uh, child groups are just this ring, well, Z. And so I just have to do this correspondence, and the correspondence is that uh, in this case, so C1 of A, uh, C1 of this CA, was just minus a times zeta. That was the convention I chose. And so that also means by the Whitney is that now if I take more generally, I take uh, v, which is a, just a vector space uh, with this with a t action, a t action. So then the fundamental theorem of representation theory tells us that then V can be represented as a, as a, a T module, then um, uh, V can be represented as the direct sum in a unique fashion as the direct sum of C um, A i's now, where A i's are some integers. And so here is a, this is notation wise a little difficult quite often. Because, um, so here you would like to say that the AI is either are some integers, but now this is not a set because some of them could coincide, right? So for example, they all could be the same. So, well, you can think of them as a sequence. So where, so, um, so, so uh, rank, V, let it be now K for simplicity. So you have then I goes from 1 to K. And this A1, AK are the weights. Weights of V. This is what we said. So actually, I'll say, formally call this the weights of V. Okay, and so you see these brackets here that just stands for because it's not a set, because there could be repetitions in it. But it's, on the other hand, these are not ordered, right? The weights uh, are just defined up to permutations. So it's kind of a set with multiplicities, the weights of a, of a, so in parentheses. So this is, this is a set with multiplicities or repetitions, right? Multiplicities of repetition, so this is a perfectly acceptable set of weights. Okay. And so now we need to do some of this, um, um, some of this game of understanding so calculus of weights. Sorry, so I, maybe I, I wanted to finish here to explain what the churn class is here. So I write that formula here, but of course you know that. So, so it's just then the, say the total churn class, equivariant churn class of, um, of V is just equal to the product of one to just the product of these things. So one minus A I zeta, where I goes from one to K. Okay, but now what I mean by calculus of weights, so often we'll need to do some uh, linear algebraic operations which will impact our weights. So um, linear algebra will impact our weights. And so this, I just write this down. For example, Uh, 
Well, there's really three things that, that appear quite often. So suppose, uh, so suppose that you have V and W, two now. Uh, these are T vector spaces. Right, so it's just two things like this, so, but they both have weights. So now I can write that, for example, weight of V is just a, a multi-set or set with multiple A1, AK, and then weights of W are equal V1, VR. So, yeah. so now the question is, I can now, uh, using two of these things, I can construct new vector spaces and I can ask what their weights are. For example, weights of V direct sum W are equal to the union of the two sets, right? So this is just equal to A1, AK, and then B1, A, yeah, BR. Okay, and similarly, the weight of um, the tensor W are equal to all the sum. So this is a little confusing. The action is the product, but this is kind of a logarithmic. So the weight is a logarithmic thing, so it's all the sums. Okay, so this is just AI plus BJ for I goes from 1 to K and, and J goes from 1 to R. Okay? So this is this. And then finally, well, let's, what about a slightly more complicated situation? For example, you want to take uh, the symmetric product of a symmetric tensor product, so if you like polynomials on, on uh, uh, V, then, well, let's just take symmetric products on, on V. So what are these weights? So you've probably seen this, but no? So, so this is a little more complicated. I mean, basically, you just have to take all the monomials in the variable. And so then a monomial will just involve some repetitions of these things. Uh, so you've shown this today? No? I don't know if said before. Yeah, yeah, we, we huh. yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, maybe, maybe then I'll just repeat slightly more precise. So, so if you like, so what is the symmetric uh, tensor product? So if I choose a basis of V, so if x1, xk is the basis of V, then this, then, um, then the, the, how do you construct a basis of, of, of symmetric product? Well, you have to construct monomials, just write all the monomials in this x1 up to xk, commutative monomials. So this means that you just take the product of xi power ni, uh, where uh, simply the sum of uh, um, ni is equal to k, uh, equal to, sorry, this is stupid, this is the l. Okay, why the be l? So, so this one, this uh, forms a basis of sin L of V. These are all the possible monomials. And so then, for each of these, then we just calculate the weight. And thus, the weights here, the weights here are now just all these things. So now the variable xi contributes ai, so it's just going to be sum of and I, A I, um, like this, with the condition that sum of N I equals to L. And so, of course, the N I's are positive, non-negative integers. I don't like that. Hmm? 
Okay. All right. So this is these are this is the basic calculus of weights that we need. Okay. So now just to have somewhat, I like this kind of elegant notation. So how in terms of these, I just recall the the, uh, res the our, our, our basic argument again. So it goes as follows. So then we can define what's called, what are the churn numbers, uh, what the churn numbers are. Churn numbers of the bundle E over the space X. So this do the following. So uh, the notation I like is that we, we, well, in general, I'll just, uh, there's always a map to the point, and then, and then I'll just denote this by pi, okay, in general. Um, then this induces, of course, a map in Chow groups, so, um, so uh, this induces a map from A, say, M. So this was dimension N that I'll keep fixed. <coughs> AM of X to A, and so you lose that n dimension, so it's m um, minus n um, of the point. And so there is this map pi star, pi lower star, so the notation I like is, so pi lower star is denoted by, as integral, okay, so then it's, Now I just write uh, today. I'll write down this formula slightly. <coughs> our, uh, the results of our calculation slightly more generally. So, um, um, so yeah. So I just yeah. Maybe I'll just uh, uh, f uh, finish this here. Then what's happening? So what's happening is that we have. So here I did not use e yet. So e will come later, right? So here, uh, in other words, uh, we have. Ah, uh, the integral mapping <coughs> am uh, x to <coughs> am minus uh, n of a point, which is equal to actually zero unless uh, unless m equals n. Right. So this means that we can only integrate precisely the the elements in the top Chow group. And then we can equally well, of course, in the active variant situation, uh, we can just have integral mapping a m t x to a m minus n point, which is this, whatever, say q uh, z. So this is uh, the basic integral thing. Maybe I'll put a T here just to, to remember that it's integration. Okay, and so, so then our formulas, they looked as follows. So we looked at this situation. So actually, I'll just let's forget about E for a second. So let's just look at X, T, our usual X, T thing, which is assumed to be finite. This is our our situation, then um, you remember we had, uh, instead of x, let's, let's look at just xt, so I just quickly recall this. So, so then, uh, um, then the Chow groups of xt are just the direct sum of zeta, or zeta, well, it depends what coefficients we take, so, well, let me, Choose Q already here, maybe it doesn't matter. So Q zeta 1 P for all these P's in, uh, in uh, XT. It's a finite set. And then uh, the idea was that we have these two maps. So we have, uh, of course, we have the embedding as usual of XT into, uh, into X, or for each P actually, there is an M P 
if you like, of the point P embedded into X. So this is for a, for a fixed point, of course. So these are, these are then equivariant maps. And uh, so the idea was this, right? So there we have XT, we have, uh, we have M upper star, M lower star, X point, um, and then you have, um, uh, you have these, sorry, you just have these, uh, no, let's just already do this, right, and then you have this, well, in this case, just Z, or Q, sorry, Q, which is the equivariant geography of the point, and then we have these M things here. And then these two maps are, of course, those two integrals that I defined. Now everything is equivariant. Uh, then, then, sorry, here, everything is equivariant. Then we have these two, uh, two maps. And so the fundamental equation, if you remember, was the following, is that if I take, um, so the fundamental equality is the following that um, if I take, so this fundamental equality that we showed in fact, not exactly in sort of practice in this form, is the following, that if you have eta um, in a, so some equivariant Tx, then we can, so the idea is that once we extend these things, put the zeta in, you know, we invert zeta, as we did last time, then these things become isomorphism. We actually can write on this map precisely, and it's the following, that if I take eta, uh, uh, then this is gonna be the same thing as, just let me fix this, I don't forget anything. Yes, so, so what we do, so it lies here, we look at um, the embedding lower side, the push forward of the following thing. So sum of um, the, sorry, the sum of the pullback of eta. So now with respect to that corresponding fixed point, and then we divide this by the equivariant churn class, top churn class, which is n here. So n is always a dimension. So this is the fundamental sort of formula. It's kind of a partition of unity kind of thing, that every eta can be described as some of the thing, a certain fixed sum of things is here. Note now I inverted zeta, so you have to everywhere invert zeta as I did last time. I'm gonna re-explain that. It's actually the formula, it's not gonna be that important. But this is the basic formula. And then the consequence of this, of course, is the following, is that now that means, so the corollary, so this is the fundamental equality, this sort of partition of unity. And so the corollary is the consequence of this is that if you take the integral, you push forward eta, then of course it's because it's, so the integral of eta of course uh, is the same as the integral, uh, well you can pull this thing through like this and so it's just gonna be the integral of what's inside here. So this is just the integral of, uh, of, of this thing, I'm not gonna copy it, but it's just the integral of, of this thing now without this M star, just what's inside the brackets, because that's what's here. And so then, then you can just calculate this, and uh, um, what, what this integral is, is that it just simply converts this one P to one in here, so this is just, So this is a general formula that I didn't write in this way because it isn't as useful as the other one. It's not as useful as the other one, but still I just now wanted to write in the general formula that you can actually integrate any class, you just have to pull it back here. The, the reason it's not as useful because then you have to calculate the pullback of these things, and that's not so necessarily so easy. 
but it is easy because of naturality in the so a good case um, is so this m uh, um, easy to calculate if if um, eta is equal to some phi of some equivariant uh, churn class of uh, of uh, equivariant characteristic class that because then because of naturality the pullback is just a churn class of of the fiber so then uh, in this case the formula is because of naturality so in this case uh, then we simply have that the pullback of eta, well, I'll write it this way. So now E is, of course, this bundle. Now we have in this situation with an equivariant uh, of E, oh, sorry, of phi E is simply by naturality phi T, phi T of EP. Right? Because when you pull back the bundle E, you get EP, and so then. And so then that formula becomes uh, simpler. Uh, so that just says that the integral of phi t of e is equal to, the equivariant integral is just equal to the sum over all fixed points of uh, phi um, t of e p divided by c t of n of t x. Uh, this is our lovely formula. And then uh, now we can, I can rewrite this now in terms of those, those um, weights, remember. So let, um, if, uh, let um, uh, the weight of EP be equal to um, A1 AR, and the weight, uh, sorry, A1 a1 of p, it will depend on p. A r of p. So this p is just a discrete, um, a discrete uh, set. It's just the fixed points, right? But I'll put them in parentheses. And then the weight of t x is equal to just some b1, p, b n, p. And again, remember, sorry, so it's this parenthesis wrong, so it's important. Parentheses like this. Okay, so then we can now write this down as a completely, a completely straightforward um, substitution. So this is then is just equal to. So then under this notation, we can just write this as sum of. Um, so we just look at phi of. Um, so I'm sorry. So this is now minus. I think minus a i. Um, a i, well, so minus a one of p minus a r of p. Sorry, this is now just an ordinary bracket. And now you see it's an ordinary bracket because it's a symmetric polynomial, and then it doesn't matter, uh, you know, it's a set with multiple, it doesn't matter. And then here, this, remember that this Cn just corresponded to the product. So this is just going to be the product of B, um, whatever, J of P for, okay, and so this goes, so this is the final formula. And so let's uh, now quickly, uh, do yeah, so this is it. This is the end. So, so you get it. and then it's it's what what uh, another little piece is that this actually makes sense for any. It doesn't matter what the rank is, but if you want in a coincidence with usual churn numbers, so the, uh, then uh, if uh, uh, phi uh, if if degree 
of phi equals n, this is important, then actually the integral of, of, of phi te, so the push forward of phi te will be the same thing as just the usual. Of course, that's precisely when this thing is, is not zero, so that it's meaningful. And this is usually what we want to calculate. Okay. Also, in that formula, are all the factors of zeta correct? Ah, sorry, yes, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I made a mistake. Yes, sorry. Sorry. No, it's just simply you need to multiply everything by zeta. Sorry. Let me just write it nicer. So it's, uh, it's phi of uh, minus a i a 1 p times zeta minus a n p times zeta. And then, yes, yeah, sorry. And then here I also made a little mistake. Sorry. So it's, it's product of I goes from 1 to n of minus this, everything is minus, b, uh, b, j, p times zeta. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, of course, when they have the same degree, then the zetas disappear, and that's, that's when it's happened, but otherwise it's there. Okay, so... Sorry about that. So, so then let's just do first um, um, churn numbers of Grassmannians. And so the idea is the following. We just look at um, we have our standard sequence, G, R, K, N, the K planes in C, N in n-dimensional space with our tautological sequence S, C, N, Q. These are actual bundles of which this is, uh, the special case is a, um, the projective space, of course. And so then we choose arbitrary, choose arbitrary so this is what's absolutely amazing about this uh, weights of the CN to be just uh, a1 a n All right so we just choose this uh, so these, these are just arbitrary integers. The only thing is that they should be different, except arbitrary, sorry, so different. So AI is not equal to AJ. And then we just uh, do our thing. So here, of course, this thing uh, uh, is, um, is uh, the zetas will, uh, yeah, so, so which let uh, um, equals the dimension of the Grassmannian, which is equal to k times n minus k. And we'll calculate the churn number. So, well, uh, that thing, of course, um, yeah, we just need to have some notation for this. So we need to first describe with x t, so the, the Grassmannian of k n t is going to be, so it's the issue of notation, right? So, so um, you remember, so it's just some k planes, k less than n, and we have to choose k of the variables in c n x one. Which, which will, who, to which this fixed point will correspond. So, so to choose that, we have to um, 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 well, it's in, I'll just write in bijection. 
is in bijection with the following set. So uh, I subset of, I'll write this way maybe. So so this is just a quick notation. Yes, so the, these coordinate k planes are, of course, in one, two, and there's a choice of the coordinates, which is just subsets of magnitude k. So just so that we remember, maybe one important thing everywhere here is that so phi, for example, can have degree n, but remember here, remember that uh, phi is in a z or q, or it doesn't matter, it could be q, c1 up to cr. Okay, so, so because E was a rank R bundle, it's, it's some, it's, it'll be rank K. So these are polynomials, so the degree is N, but it's in R variables, right? So anyway, so going back here, so we have the fixed points, and then at each, these are these P's, and now we just have to identify these things here. So this is fairly easy because, um, so suppose now that I, I want to calculate um, some Phi S. Okay, so my bundle E is going to be S. And so it's easy to see. So I now need, just need to find the weights of SP, right? So the weights of SP. Uh, SP, so now P, uh, yes, yeah, so sorry. So it's there in one to one correspondence. So maybe, let me just write this way now. So uh, yeah, I, sh I need a annotation for this, sorry. So just, the, so then uh, this, the invariant part can be just written as P sub I, so points sub I, where I is in this set. I didn't copy. So they're in one-to-one -one correspondence, but I should have just written that they actually, there are some, to each such set, a point corresponds, and I denote that point by pi. Sorry about that. So then weights of sp sub i, so that plane that corresponds to that set of ones, and then, of course, it's just equal to um, the corresponding weights. So this is just uh, a um, j for j in i. So this is an works out to be compact notation. I take those variables that are, have indices in this subset and I take the corresponding weights and this is a multiset and I take that. And this is a, now a k-tuple of elements because it's k. I'll go a little bit over time just to finish this. And then now I just need the other thing. So you remember that t uh, Grassmannian is just the tangent bundle of the Grassmannian is just HOM SQ. You need the weight, so the weight of uh, TP, um, TP Grassmannian is just going to be equal. And so now I need, remember, the, this is the dimension, so I need this many weights. So that will be. Well, the weights of S, you remember now we had that thing about the tensor product, weights of S, but with a minus sign. And then, then with the weights, uh, and the weights of Q with a plus sign. So that's just going to be um, um, A, I, A, J minus A, I, where now I is in I and J is not in I. Well, of course, all these indices are from 1 to n, but you take the subset, this a and i, these weights are the weights of s, and of course, the remaining weights 
R and Q because we have this exact sequence. So all in S and Q at every point, all the weights should appear. And they're simply split into two parts, the, uh, the ones in S and the one in Q. So this is what you get. So now you see it's also important that they are not equal because we don't want any zeros here. We don't want any zeros here because these are the weights we divide by. So actually you can have zeros upstairs and in my example we did have zeros upstairs, but uh, downstairs here we cannot have zeros. So this cannot be zero. So this, that's what was important. Okay, and so that's it. So this is now the formula is simply the sum of, and so yeah, the way I did this now, there's a minus sign for each. Uh, there would be, well, there is a minus sign, yeah. So it's uh, um, minus, um, uh, so it's a product of, and so it's, it's precisely that thing over there. So it's just a repetition of that. Phi minus A, um, uh, um, yeah, minus A, So yes, so A, so this is for I equals K. And here I put minus A J, sorry, for A I. I don't know why I said J. A I for I A I. And I divide by the product of all these numbers here. So these are A J minus A I, ah, oh, sorry. There's a minus sign, so that's a i minus a j. A i minus a j. So, of course, again, I have to put here the zeta. Zeta, and this product, uh, and this thing came in here. It's not supposed to. This product goes uh, where uh, i in i. And J is nothing. Okay. So, so this is how finally in the, the first special case, well you, you did this in your homework, uh, you get um, you get the formulas um, for uh, for the Grassmannian of C24, but you know I'll stop now and then continue doing it. So in the second half then, so I will just give one more application, then and then I'll do uh, uh, I'll start somehow the next part of this course, which is about Hilbert schemes um, of points, which is kind of a very amusing thing. In a certain sense, the part I'll do is a bit more, more elementary, actually, than, uh, than this was, but you'll see. Okay. Okay, so let me continue. So, yes. So where am I? Yeah, so here is, here is this formula. So then any, um, any uh, integration form that we had with the Grassmann, only Grassmannian, then we can use these formulas for it. So for example, uh, let me remind you, so I'll, I'll maybe, um, just a sec. So for example, the other application. So this is the final formula for a churn class. So I, maybe I, I'll just, uh, yeah, so, yeah, maybe let's just um, give one quick example here. So example, say, um, say, uh, we look at uh, x equals the Grassmannian of two planes in five-dimensional space, and we would like to calculate a particular churn number. For example, we would like to calculate, uh, so it has to, this is now six-dimensional, it's n times n minus k, so six-dimensional, so we need a six-dimensional thing, so it should be something like, um, C2 times uh, S times C, um, C, C2 squared C1 squared S. Sorry, I didn't think this through. Okay. So, for example, we want to calculate this thing. 
on this Grassmannian of T5. So then we just, okay, so we need to, so remember the procedures, so now I just, I explained this for 2.4, but just very quickly now, I'll just do it a little more carefully, but it's, it's always the same. You choose these numbers, so for five, you have like an obvious, simple choice. So you choose the, let's, um, so the weight, I don't know, denoted necessary on C5. We can choose them. So these just have to be different numbers. This could be minus two, um, minus one, zero, uh, one, and two, say. Okay. And, um, so then the formula will look like as follows. So we have five choose two. So we have um, uh, x, I'll just say t, uh, is the number of elements is five choose two equals to 10. So there is 10 fixed points. And then we just write down the corresponding polynomial. So the only thing to remember is that. So I'll maybe just uh, uh, choose uh, one, one instead of rewriting this formula, which you can see anyway, I just choose one element. So, so for each fixed point, for each choice of a pair in here, you'll have, uh, you will have a particular term, right? So let's just um, to each. So this actually uh, to each um, i one five with two elements, um, you will associate a concrete rational number. Number, uh, the concrete rational number, maybe like this. The term in this sum. So uh, let's just calculate it for one of them. So for example, let just i to be, uh, so it's a subset, so this will be say one and two. So remember, i is a subset of the numbers from one to five, I choose the first two. And then what I have to do, so all these, these, these polynomials, c1 square c, C2 is a, um, is a, um, a two variable function. So, so what I need to do now, so I, I would like to find this contribution, so the corresponding term. Okay, so I need to both do a little bit of work upstairs and downstairs. So in this case, sorry, yeah. So in this case, these zetas will cancel because the dimension of the, ran, the degree upstairs is six, right? It's two times two plus two times one. And downstairs is also six because it's, it's a six dimensional space. So the zeta will not appear in this situation. So we will actually get the, get just the number, the corresponding churn number. So um, now here I, uh, we need to do a little bit. So we have to convert now uh, the function C1 squared C2 squared um, in two variables. So we'll, we'll go to a function in two variables, say let's call those lambda one, lambda two, as in the original thing. This corresponds, so this function phi corresponds to the following function, phi with a little dot, uh, which is, so this is just the sum, so it's lambda one plus lambda two, and I square it, and it's, it's a ring homomorphism, and then this is just lambda one times lambda two squared. So this is my function, okay? So this function, we convert into a function in, in the symmetric, uh, in, in that correspondence with which I started. And so then what we do is we just substitute into this function the, the two weights. So here, now here I start. So the weight of S mod PI are just two weights. So the first weight and the second weight. So so it's minus two and minus one. And then the weights of T, P, I, the tangent weights are, are just, so there will be six weights. And these are all the differences between, of these weights 
with these weights. So, um, um, uh, yeah, so I have to subtract now this way and then take a minus sign, I apologize for that. So, so I just take all of the differences here. So the biggest one is four, is this minus this. And then there is two ways you can get three. So there's two ways that are three. And then there is, um, uh, what is it, one, two, uh, yeah, so one, two ways that are two. And then, am I doing this right? Four, maybe that I should do it the other way. Four and three, okay? Then three and two, yeah, maybe so there are three and two. Four, three, three, two, two, one. Right, that's it. One, two, three, four, five, six. These are the weights. Okay, so then you just use that formula. These are these weights here. So then the corresponding, um, sorry, it's a little bit confused here, but I'll continue here. So these are the details. So the function you identify, the ways you identify, and now you simply substitute into that thing those, uh, those values. And so what you get is you substitute the minus these weights into that formula. So, so what you get is uh, 2 plus 1 squared times 2 squared times 1. And then you divide, so that's that function substituted these two numbers with minus signs, and here is just the product of all these numbers. Minus sign, it's an even number, so it's, it's, um, the sign is irrelevant, so it's going to be just 4 times 9 times 4 again. Okay? And so actually you get some relatively nice thing. This 3 squared cancels this 9, and this 2 squared cancels this 4, and so the actual number is 1 quarter. Okay? So finally, this is equal to one quarter if I didn't make a mistake, which I don't think I did. Usually I do, but no, I don't think I did. Okay, okay so it's one quarter. So uh, amazing, again, these things are rational numbers, even though the final Achure number is always an integer. So this, the answer has to be an integer. It counts something. Well, we just got one contribution. is one quarter, and then you can calculate all the other things, and you'll get. And as I said, so there's two imp important things. One, uh, maybe I'll even write them down here. Maybe I'll erase this and just write it here, okay? So sorry, this was all, so it started here, this one remark, and then this is the calculation, the one quarter. So the point is that um, the final result, this integral uh, t phi t e, is independent of the chosen weights. Or, or S, if you like, in this case. Maybe, yeah, let's just go to this case. So, so if you calculate this push forward, of course, it, it um, well, again, in this degree phi equals N case, it will not depend on these chosen weights. Okay, so. This is some amazing identity. I could put here any other five numbers, any other five integers that are different. Do the same calculation. Obviously, this number will be different. That's because, I mean, if you change the AIs, the terms will be different. But when you add them up, you get the same thing. An, an integer which does not depend on the AIs. Okay, this is kind of hard to believe, but you can actually do it, and then you'll get it. And in fact, um, I... Uh, for a while I worked on this, so I have some understanding. So if you actually try to just prove this independently, like I give you this formula and prove it that this formula without algebraic geometry, just using you know, elementary you know, high school mathematics, and try to prove that the result does not depend on the AIs, for example. Um, I don't know, even for G, uh, the calculus GR24, I, there's a simple way to do it for the projective space using some residue calculus and complex analysis, but actually this one is just rather difficult, complex analysis. I mean, this is not so easy. So actually to prove this is, is, is very difficult. The, the, of course, the simplest proof is just to know that the result is this intersection number. So this is pretty amazing. And that's one thing. The, so this is just one remark. And then uh, the, another remark is that um, 
yes, it's independent, so maybe actually this is just a sub-remark of this one, is uh, one can choose, one can choose um, the AIs wisely. You can see that there's a lambda 1 plus lambda 2 here to some power. So that means that any time your chosen two vectors are the opposite one, these two, so in this and this case, um, so in two of the ten cases, then this factor will be zero. And there's also lambda ones and lambda twos there. So that means that any time the zero is in there, this is also zero, the numerator, right? So this, this particular one. So that gives you four cases. So if you choose with these weights, actually, uh, six out of the ten fixed points will contribute zero. So you only have to calculate four. And this you can do in more generally, and so this is, and so actually if you look, there are some, yeah, some um, actually computer scientific approach to whether Schubert calculus is better or localization, but residue form is better to calculate these things. And of course this is better. Um, it's a little annoying because doing by hand, it's not so much better because you have no idea what's going on, right? I mean, you do, I got one quarter, what is this one quarter? I mean, you don't, when you do it by hand, it's not so easy. But if it, a, calc, a computer does it, the computer doesn't care about not knowing what it's doing, it's just, and then, then it's much, much better. So actually, there's a computer science uh, aspect of this thing. And maybe the other thing, Quickly, if you say, um, just an example of a similar calculation, you remember if you take, uh, so this is example two, so if you take, for example, um, Pn minus one, and we take the, the, um, the uh, uh, degree d, so, X uh, gener general general degree D uh, hypersurface. Um, so it's just given by one degree D polynomial, right? And it's general, so it's going to be smooth. And then um, the number of K. Uh, well, so k planes in that sense, so k minus one uh, planes in the projective sense. You know, you remember there's always this confusion. The projective k minus one planes uh, in x. So this was this final calculation, as you remember, right? So, so of course, this is a final variety. So just so that uh, I just want to write down the simplest formula, I will assume that this is dimension zero. So this is dimension zero. Um, uh, so if you want really the number, um, so if you want the number, then you need the, the dimension of this variety should be zero. So the dimension of this final variety, f, f uh, um, n, k, d, zero, that's this set, uh, is equivalent to the to some numerical thing. So that just means that the Grassmannian, which is uh, uh, the dimension of the Grassmannian, should be the same as the dimension of, of these, uh, of, um, of these um, polynomials vanishing or something. So, so the Grassmannian's dimension is k times n minus k. And then this is uh, the other thing is uh, d plus k minus 1 choose d, I think. I think it's this. Okay. So this is some condition, let's just assume it's true. If it's not true, then you get a higher dimension of variety, and you can calculate its degree, and the formula is slightly more complicated. But, so let's just assume that then, then this is really a number, and then I'm just writing down a formula for this number. And you remember uh, this number, if you look back in your notes, this was simply the integral on the Grassmannian of k planes, so the same Grassmannian of um, C, um, uh, C uh, top, so uh, of uh, sim uh, S dual 
and so the degree is d. Okay. So, and the top, of course, now top is actually the same as the dimension. That's what I assume. You see, this is the rank of this bundle, and this is the dimension of the same. So the top, in this case, is just equal to these three numbers, these two numbers. Okay. And so then we just get again a number as I wanted just there, but now I write it down more generally. And of course, it's precisely the same thing. Of course, it's going to be a little uglier, but the idea is still the same. So you just get the sum of. Um, and so now you take uh, again, so you just take these i's, whose uh, number of elements now is um, k. And uh, yeah, so n is, yeah, n is fixed, number is k. So these are the fixed points, yes, on that, that thing. So i is a subset of 1n. So the same story as there. And actually, what you have under is precisely what we had before. So it's just the product of a i minus a j. Sorry, so you choose these numbers, a1, a n different integers. Okay, so you just have this product like that. So i is in i, j is not in i. And then upstairs you get this slightly more complicated, but you remember we calculated that same thing at the beginning. So, so you get some, some formula like, so it's a churn, top churn class, so it's going to be a product of all the weights of this thing, so it's a product. And then, uh, so each of these things is actually just a choice of, uh, uh, of numbers. Well, you'll see n, n1 up to n, um, uh, n uh, d. So it's just the sum of, so this is now the corresponding weight of the corresponding monomial is uh, n i. Uh, uh, a i. So now here, this i is going to be in this thing. So in 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 in, 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 in oh, sorry. So we just look at those weights and the yeah. So this is the weight of that monomial. And here we just look at the sum of n i's is equal to d, the degree. Sorry, so this is not visible. Let me just, sorry. So it's the product of sum of n i equals d. And here I have sum of n i a i, i in i. And so here uh, also i is just in i. So some form like this. But it corresponds to precisely what I did before. Okay, calculate and get the answer. Okay. So how much time do I have? Not that much. So, so I wanted to give you some motivation, but maybe I'm not going to give you motivation for now. Maybe next time I want to explain this Hilbert scheme of points thing. I want to get started on it so that tomorrow I can get somewhere. Okay. So the idea is the following. is The motivation I just say in words is that uh, when you are trying to say when we're calculating, um, uh, for example, these nodal curves, remember we looked at the generic curve and then, then calculated the number of uh, nodal cur curves having one nodal point, then we did something about looking at, uh, finally this was some integral of on some, say on P2, so we just the simplest thing, P2. The two dimensions. I wanted degree d curve, some families, and we wanted how many are nodal. And then there was a form, it was actually three times d minus one squared. That's the number if you take degree d curves. But the technique was that we fixed, we looked at this universal thing, we fixed the point, and I said, what is the condition that is singular there? And it's, that was our usual, usual technique. So I don't want to recall this now because then I don't get anywhere, maybe next time. But um, uh, the point is that the question is, what if you want to count the number of curves with two nodes? Okay, so 
So what happens if you have two nodes? So now I don't, I don't have time to, to go through that, trying to do that, but it turns out that you cannot do that with this method. And essentially the reason you can't do that, because, so remember, so here the idea is that you fix the point in P2 and asked what is the condition that the curve is singular there, and then you took, for, took it from there. Well now, if you have these two things, then essentially it, it, what you will have to do is just to integrate, so I'm just putting some motivation part. So you need, to, you need to somehow calculate some integrals on two points, on the space of two points on P2. And here is some churn class. So instead of just on P2, which was the actual calculation, you have two points on P2. And two points on P2, the bundle is actually can kind of explain what it is, but the two points in P2 is not a space to unordered points. So you can try to just define that space, but if you just define it by you know, taking uh, the quotient of, of P2 cross P2, then it's not going to be smooth. And, that, and we cannot calculate integrals on non-smooth things, so, so uh, it turns out that there's a smooth version of this, and this is what I want to explain. So the motivation is simply a smooth or a desingularization version of endpoints. And so actually it's a local question, so let me just do endpoints on A2, so two-dimensional affine space, just the plane, okay? This is, so this actually comes from there, but I don't want to go through that, um, okay? So, so then I can still explain something, yeah. So this I don't explain, and then I'm here. So first I'll just define this space. It's very, very simple. The definition, it's called the Hilbert scheme, Hilbert scheme of points on the plane. Okay, so the name of this is the Hilbert scheme of points on the plane, and it's defined the following way. So let's just one thing, I'll denote by R the function string of, of A2. So that's just a, a polynomial ring in two variables, okay? And now uh, the Hilbert scheme of points, so I'll just denote it this way. I usually put the A2 there, but we will only deal with that, so I'm going to omit that from the notation. It's a very simple thing. You simply look at, so Hilbert scheme usually just means just you look at all sub-varieties with some fixed invariance. So, so the, here the sub-variety will be just a finite set of points, basically, or, uh, yeah. So, so that means we just define the defining ideal, so ideal, and then the fact that it's a finite set of points is a very simple uh, a condition that the co-dimension I is N, okay? So it's a very, very basic thing. You just take a pol the polynomial ring into variables and you ask for the uh, uh, for the set space of the ideals of co-dimension n in it, okay? So what I will have time, uh, yeah. So maybe the big theorem of, of Grothendieck, so this is certainly a set, you won't argue with that, but Grothendieck says the following, that in much wide, huge greater generality that I'm not even having. This, this is a scheme, this has a scheme structure. Scheme structure. I mean much more generally, I mean sorry. And let me continue it here. So I just defined a set, and you remember I just said that, like for example, well, there are ways, but still to get, define an algebraic variety as fine and a set of points is not so easy. This a priori is given to you forever. That is always an algebraic scheme here. So now uh, I will add that, of course, I'm not going to define what that is, but I'm going to tell you what the tangent space is, and that's the most important thing for us. So with with Zariski, 
so this tangent space of, of Hilb um, equals, and the point is that if you think about it, this is, seems totally new, but actually it's not so totally new because it, what is this really? I mean, this is a vector space. Okay, it's a little bit infinite dimensional, but it's still a vector space. And this is a subspace of finite of co-dimension n, right? So, so actually this is a Grassmannian really, right, in a sense. It's, an infinite, it's a part of a Grassmannian because of course we are not allowed to take any subspace, anyway this would be an infinite dimensional, but only allowed to take subspaces where, where, the, where, where which are ideals. But this part, so it's some, some sort of Grassmannian and so it's not so surprising what's happening here that the tangent space is just given the following way. You still have this universal sequence. Maybe I should have written that down first, sorry. Uh, so the universal sequence is that you just take i, r, and r mod i. So I apologize, this, this is important. So this makes pi, this exists over, so this may be, so this is the first statement, one. This is the second statement that there's a universal, you know, you know, these bundles on this space. So there's a bu the trivial bundle, which is just R, the, the sub-bundle, just like we had for the grass mine. So it's the same thing as for the grass mine, the same I, and then, of course, there's a quotient bundle. And now this quotient is actually a finite dimensional, okay? And here, now, of course, you won't be, won't be surprised that this is just HOM I R mod I. But now, just important, what I mean by home, because the only thing is that, what is an ideal, right? Remember, an ideal, I'll do some details later, but it's an R module, right? So it's invariant on multiplication by R, right? So, so, what I, so this is an R module, this is an R module, and this is a quotient R module, okay? So, so this is a morphism, it's linear, but it should be commute with the action of R. Now, the action of R is not so confusing, actually. I mean, because R is simply, it's a free algebra. It's too generous, so it just you, it means it's compatible with X and compatible with Y, okay? So this is what I would like to, uh, well, I'll now do the details, but I hope that, you know, at least formally this is clear. And um, so this is actually the general, general, Thing. And then the fourth thing is that this actually, so four, is that, now this was completely too general, but in, in, in our particular case, uh, the rank of this Ti field n is equal to 2n for every i. So in other words, it's constant. And actually, this is what I would like you to work a little bit on. So I'll start explaining this and then maybe they could be, I'll give some homework problems on this, okay? So, uh, so but what this means, so the corollary, of course, that this is smooth, this space, because if the tangent space is always the same dimension, then it's smooth. So the corollary is that this hill band is smooth. And then if you do it, you can, of course, you do it as it's done locally, but on P2, you can do it in any chart, and that will be also smooth. So there is an, uh, yeah, and that will be the space we're looking for. So what I have time for, so is this, do I have any questions? Or is this incomprehensible? I mean, it's vaguely comprehensible, no? I mean, uh, ideals, etc. Well, I'll do the examples, and you will see, okay? So first of all, uh, one point is that, so let me just, Let's just do um, n equals two. So I'm gonna do n equals one, let's just do n equals two. So we do two points on the plane, okay? Well, that is, well, it's a compactification of that. So, so first, I would like to say the following thing. So the first point is that if I take two points on the plane, so let's say p equals uh, a1, so p1 equals a1, b1, and, um, P2 equals A2, B2. Uh, these are now in, in A2, All right? So these are two points. Then these two points, I mean, this is why, I, what's the link with what I was saying before, of course define a codimension 
two ideal. So what is that? So there is this I, P1, P2, which is just all the functions uh, such that f of p1 equals f of p2. And uh, the point is that it's easy to see that this is, um, this is uh, um, co-dimension 2. In a sense, I mean, one way you can easily describe, of course, what this r mod i is. So that's what I would like to explain. So what is r mod i? So sorry, this, let's say these are not, not equal, these two. So, so then, again, so everything is an R module here. Uh, um, R mod I P1 P2 is a, so co-dimension is two, so this is dimension is two, so this is a two-dimensional, sorry, I did something stupid here, yeah, sorry, it's mod, it's not correct. But I wanted to say R factored by I P1 P2 is a two-dimensional R module, right? So let's describe the two-dimensional R module. So what is it? Okay, so a two-dimensional is just C plus C. It's two-dimensional vector space. It's, uh, so it's actually associated to the, these two points. So uh, so R mod I P1 P2 is just equal to, um, so two copies uh, C, so it's just a copy of P1, so I don't know. Um, yeah, well, I'll, let me just say it's okay, if, 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 I denote by L, okay, L P1, so, um, okay, L P1, or maybe M P2, sorry, okay? So it's two-dimensional, and I just have to describe, this is a module over R, what is the action? So to, find, to define that this is an R module, as I said, of course, there is a one here, one always acts by one, and then there is X and there is Y, and you just have to tell how they act. So how does X act on, on say, LP1? Hmm? Yeah, I mean, it's so. Well, X is this should X acts on now acting on a line that can only be multiplication by number, right? It's a linear action. So it multiplies by number. And what is the number? Well, of course, it's this. This is this spectral idea. So, so X on LP1 is multiplication by a one. And of course then y acting on e one is multiplication by b one. Okay, and then, so this is, and these are, and then what happens, um, yeah. So that's it, that, that, that's the action, right? And then, I still have a little time. So, yeah. So you, you, you see what's happening. So in particular, I mean, in principle now, you, what I would like you to think about is, is, is how to prove that this is two n dimensional, like prove that this is four dimensional. Okay, so that I'll, in the remaining fight, I'll try to explain that. So why is that four dimensional? So this is some really basic, well, really basic. It's some very nice commutative algebra. And you can see by, for two points, you can still do by hand, but then if you not, then I will not be able to explain the general, yeah. Um, is it uh, like easy or clear what is this uh, I, this universal I? What do you mean? It is the universal ideal, I. Yeah, but, uh, I mean, it is a, that. A bundle, or... uh, yeah, it's a sheaf, it's a module, it's a... It's not always like locally, uh, locally free, No, I'll just explain it. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, no, so it's a little, I'm a little loose here, it's kind of a bundle, but it's... Yeah, it's true, it's, it's a little annoying. I have this space, which is a perfectly good, smooth, finite dimensional variety, and then there's a sequence, but two of these things are actually infinite dimensional, but okay, but as modules, they're actually finite dimensional, as you will see, because for me, R is just rank one, basically, right? And this is also approximate rank one. 
Well, let me just do this. So let me, for example, a quick example. So let's, uh, let me just choose these points wisely. So let's choose these two points. This is the x and the y axis. Um, so, or maybe, what was it that I wanted? Uh, let's, no, let's do this too. So this is one. Okay, so let's just choose these two points. Okay, so let's calculate this ideal. So, I mean, you know how these ideals work. So, so if you want, what is this, this point? So for this point, the ideal is that you take x. Uh, so x, uh, so the, if you like, the ideal of this line, the x is just xr, right? And I want the intersection with the other ones. So what is that going to be? So what is the ideal of the origin? XY is, the, yeah, it's confusing. So there's two operations. One is the product and the other, the sum, exactly. You forgot, you forgot. Yeah, that was at the beginning of the course last year, yeah. So, so yeah, so when, when it's an intersection of two things, then it's the sum of two ideals, yes, yes. So if you think about it, right, it's, it's this thing really is zero precisely here. And then, but now, when I take another point, now it's the product, right? So this was an intersection of two things, now it's a union of two things. So it's just, right, this is the other, other thing, okay? And now you multiply this out, and what do you get? I claim that you get just xr plus y times y minus one. It's easy to see. That's just because you see y r plus y minus this sum of these two is just r. Y r plus y minus one r is r. You can check. Well, this is a little exercise to check. Okay. So, so what we see is that actually the ideal, as an r module, has two generators, and then there is one syzygy actually, right? Because, so what I'm just trying to say is, what if I'm trying to calculate, so this is the ideal of these two points. So I'm trying to calculate hom i r mod i. And this one I just explained what it is. I'm just trying to explain better what this is, how to think about this. And so what this is, is that you basically just have two generators, but uh, so form the ideal is, is this, but it's not free, right? It's generated by two things, by x, and on the end by this, but there is a relation, right? So you have sort of, you can write it this way. I mean, there's various ways of saying this. You just shouldn't go too much. Yeah. No. So, uh, no, 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 no. Um, well, you can see it's true. I mean, certainly x equals zero contains these two points. So it's, so, okay, well, let me just finish. So, because now I'm really uh, over time, so, so I just want to explain one thing here, is that really one way of saying this is that you have, um, if you like, you have this xr plus um, y times y minus r um, as a formal thing, if you like. So now, uh, sorry, so maybe, you know, maybe, let me just, just one second. So what I'm trying to say is that the way to think about this is that there is R here. And I want to describe the, uh, the ideal in it, okay? And so the way to describe it is that I can now take R times something, some generator one, gamma one, and R times another thing, a generator two. So these are two free modules, and I can map them here. And the way I do that, that of course gamma one goes to x and gamma two goes to y. Oh, sorry, y times y minus one, okay? And this is precisely what I'm saying here somehow, that i is generated by these things. This is a surjective, surjective map now, if you like, yeah, okay? But the fact is not free that there is something happening, which is that this thing has a kernel, and the kernel is fairly obvious, I mean, it has to be true that, um, so the kernel here, so the kernel of this map, is that, of course, when I take a gamma one and I multiply it by, um, um, 
So it's going to be some r of uh, omega. And omega will just go to, and so of course, if I go gamma 1 uh, and multiply it by y times y minus 1, and I subtract gamma 2 multiplied by x, then this, when I go here, it will go to 0. Both of those things will go to just uh, gamma x times y times y minus 1. Okay. And so, yeah, so that's why I'm doing this is because now this gives you an idea of how to calculate, you know, home i, r mod i. I mean, you kind of, it's easy to map free things somewhere. So you have free things with a relation. And this is what you will need to, need to calculate. I think this is enough. I mean, I'll maybe write this down a bit more detail in the, in the problem set and then you'll see. Okay? So our purpose now is just to really uh, confirm in cases that we understand that this space is smooth and I'll discuss a bit more about it. This is a very important thing. It's still played today a major role in, in numerative geology. Okay.